Last week, we were talking about the different kinds of world building, and I mentioned one kind of world building called scientific world building, which I think is very good but isn't used nearly enough. And I told you about a book that uses scientific world building and is amazing, and not just because it has transsexual aliens, The Gods Themselves by Isaac Asimov. In this book, there is a race of aliens in a dying world. And in their universe, which I'm going to call Universe A, the strong force is stronger than in our universe. And if you don't know what the strong force is, don't worry. All you have to know is that it is the physical force that keeps neutrons and protons together and that it is responsible for the process that makes stars shine and radioactive decays. Anyway, because of the different physical laws in Universe A, stars need less mass in order to form. This means that stars are smaller, they burn faster, and there are more of them. This is very bad news for a civilization in a planet whose star is dying out. This civilization is made out of two intelligent alien species. The soft ones are the hard ones. The soft ones are basically sentient clouds of gas. And the hard ones are described vaguely, but I imagine them as huge black arthropods. This planet has already gone through a catastrophic ecological decay. There is no life left on the surface, which is very bad for the soft ones because they are photosynthetic. They need light in order to survive. And so once in a while, they have to go to the surface to absorb what little light there is. But that's the least of their problems because they seem to have only a few decades before their star runs out and they all starve and freeze to death. However, one of their scientists might have found a solution, because this scientist found a way to switch matter between universes with slightly different physical constants. So they look for another universe, Universe B, which has a slightly weaker strong force. This means that it would have larger stars that burn for a longer time, but more importantly, elements that are stable in Universe B would not be stable in Universe A. They would be radioactive. This means that they have a basically infinite supply of radioactive matter they can use to produce the energy their civilization so desperately needs. And now I want to talk about the alien characters, because for me, the two best parts of this book are the ending and the alien characters. There are three alien protagonists, Odin, Dua, and Trit. Their names are based on the Russian words for one, two, and three. And this is weird, because Isaac Asimov was born in Russia, and he moved to the United States when he was eight, at which point he became very patriotic. But he rarely seems to acknowledge his Russian heritage. I mean, he doesn't deny it, but this is one of the few instances in his books that I can think of in which he uses it at all. Anyway. The protagonists are soft ones, and their species has three genders, left, middles, and rights. And they are named because of the positions they have to take in order to have sex, which means they all must be facing the same direction. Huh. Alternatively, the lefts are called rationals, the middles are called emotionals, and the rights are called parentals, because of the stereotypes their culture has of the roles they have to play in society. Also, lefts and rights use male pronouns, but middle ones use female pronouns, which is about to become relevant. Because Dua, a middle one, over the course of the book starts questioning her gender and ends up admitting to herself and to her husbands that she doesn't want to be a middle, she wants to be a left. Which is a big problem because remember that their species is dying out. So the government has resorted to assigning everyone in triads who absolutely must produce at least three children in order to maintain the population. In this way, Dua is forced to perform her gender as a middle, and she has to deal with the fact that her being a middle does make her husbands happy, and she does love the children they have together. Also, the book describes her masturbating a bunch of times which they do by passing through walls, which is very weird, but like alien sex, can you? Asimov never uses the word transsexual in this book, and I cannot find any controversy surrounding it, 
I think because the setting is so strange that it serves as a sort of shield, you know? But despite that, I think that Dua is relatable. I mean, I have never considered transsexual issues before I read this book, and yet, while reading it, I found myself thinking, I wish Dua could be a left. She wants that so much, it would make her so happy. Why can't she? Why shouldn't she? Or him, I think. The book always uses female pronouns with her, and so that's what I'm gonna do, but perhaps we should use male pronouns with referring to this character. I mean, I don't know. Also, Odin and Trit met years before they met Dua, and they fell in love. And remember that they both use male pronouns, so they were basically a gay couple. Kinda, I mean, can you even be gay when you need two men and a woman to procreate? Said no one before in the history of humankind? Anyway, at least for us, the readers, they are gay. And Asimov even describes them having sex, which again is really weird because alien sex. Uh, they even mention how frustrating it is that they cannot have children by themselves, which, yeah, it must be frustrating if that's what you want. If you are gay or transsexual, please read this book. I want to know what you think of it, how it portrays the transsexual and homosexual experience. And I also want to know what you think of the ending of that section of the book, because it's also very weird. <laughs> Meanwhile, turns out that Universe B is actually our universe. Surprise! And it is the future. And one day, a guy walks into his office and he finds a block of tungsten he had lying around. But it is not tungsten anymore. It has become plutonium-186. But here's the thing, plutonium-186 doesn't exist in our universe, and it is radioactive. So, long story short, what ends up happening is that they figure out that there are aliens in another universe that are switching tungsten from our universe with plutonium from their universe. But here's the thing, while tungsten is not radioactive in our universe, it is radioactive in theirs, so they can use it as a source of energy. But plutonium-186 is not radioactive in their universe, but it is in ours. And so, we can also use it as a source of energy. Asimov describes it as a road that it goes downward no matter which way you travel. Because no matter which way the matter goes between the universes, you always end up with energy. Now, literature is full of cool ideas that don't really make sense. So, does this idea make sense? Well, let's put my master's degree in physics to work. What is happening is that this machine, however it works, is switching one amount of matter in one universe for the same amount of matter in another universe. Sure, they are different elements, but the amount of mass is the same. So that's conservation of mass, that's good. Now, for conservation of energy, both universes are gaining sources of energy, but they are not gaining energy itself. What happens is that mass and energy are two sides of the same coin. Do you know the famous equation E equals mc squared? Well, it just means that the energy is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared. So, to know how much energy is in this fluid, I would just need to take its mass and multiply by the speed of light squared, which would be a lot of energy because the speed of light is a huge number. But what happens is that we cannot usually access this energy but we can with radioactive elements. So while both universes end up with the same amount of energy, they end up with more accessible energy. Which means that something weird must be going on with the entropy there. I guess the machine can be putting all that extra entropy in some place far away from where the matter switching is happening. Yeah, that could work. Now, for the impossible elements, it gets a little trickier. What happens is that the universe is full of fields. Lepton fields, quark fields, boson fields. And the properties of these fields determine what are the laws of physics in our universe. So what this machine is doing is creating local perturbations in the field. So for example, if the field is usually some uniform value everywhere in our universe, what this machine is doing is suddenly creating a perturbation, a place where that value changes. And sure enough, we would expect that perturbation to eventually even out, as similarly as it happens in the book, it dissipates through the field. 
Now, I don't know why wouldn't that perturbation dissipate at the speed of light very quickly before it could have any noticeable effect, but it doesn't seem completely impossible, to me at least, to perpetuate a perturbation in the field, so that maybe the machine is continuing to preserve that perturbation in the field in order to preserve the properties of those pieces of matter. So yeah, it does make sense, kinda. The most unrealistic part of all of this is that it somehow takes you less energy to produce these perturbations in the field than the energy you actually gain from the radioactive elements. Although that plot hole kinda gets patched near the end of the book, uh, but we'll get there. Although, admittedly, none of this is my area of expertise. But you know whose area of expertise it is? Matthew John from PBS Space Time. It is one of my favorite YouTube channels, and I would like to make a collaboration with him discussing the ideas of Asimov in this book and the ideas of Asimov in general. So if you want to see that video, please help me sending him a link to this moment in this video, along with some nice message. Here are all the different ways to contact him, and let's see what happens. Moving on, the best part of war building in this book comes actually at the end, and it's gonna blow your fucking minds, just wait for it. Eventually, humanity and the aliens manage to communicate, and they decide to collaborate. Humanity sets up these pumping stations, where tungsten is switched into plutonium-186, and then they use this plutonium to produce clean energy. Beautiful, everyone wins, everything's nice. Except that after a few decades of this, a scientist, Carl Denison, discovers that it's not so nice as it seems. Remember how the difference between the universes is the strength of the strong force? Well, it turns out that when you switch matter between universes, it actually changes the value of the strong force in that piece of matter. This change then dissipates, kinda like heat, so that eventually it evens out and ends up being insignificant, kinda like putting a block of ice in the ocean. It's not gonna change its temperature by anything that you could possibly measure, right? Well, not in this case, because Denison discovers that this change to the strong force is actually piling up next to the sun, probably because of the gravity. Actually, Asimov never quite goes in depth as to why that is happening, doesn't matter. The point is that this is a problem, because if the strong force becomes too strong inside the sun, then the sun will create too much energy and it will explode. And then the sun has just got a girlfriend. The sun cannot explode now. But it turns out that pumping stations have become a huge business, and people have gotten used to this very convenient technology. So they dismiss Denison's warnings, and they don't want to change. This means that Asimov actually wins this rubber dog for writing an allegory about our dependency of fossil fuels and climate change back in 1972. And yeah, I know Asimov is dead, but if his wife Janet wants to claim this rubber dog, I'll send it right to her. And this is where the magic happens. Denison realizes that people won't go back to previous technologies. So, fuck it. They science their way into this mess, and by multipack, they will science their way out of it as well. Denison reasons that if aliens were able to find a universe with a higher value of the strong force, then humans should be able to do the same, right? So, he remembers how the strong force correlates with the size and amount of stars, and he starts looking for universes with fewer and fewer stars. But he can't start switching matter with those universes, because if there is life there, he will just be putting those living beings in the same problem that humanity is now. And so he looks for a universe in which all matter is forming one single star. Universe C. Humanity can switch matter with Universe C, which will increase the value of the strong force, but then they just need to continue switching matter with universe A, which will decrease the value of the strong force. By switching the right amount of matter from both universes, they can keep the value of the strong force as it should be in our universe. Which means that people can keep making money out of pumping stations, and nobody has to change their way of life. It is a happy ending where everyone gets everything they wanted, and it feels very much earned. So, 
Well done, Asimov. That's an extra thousand points for you. But this is the coolest part. Denison realizes that if they continue to switch matter with universe C, then they will change the value of the strong force in that universe. And just as the song was gonna explode, the one star in universe C will explode. And then he realizes that, well, maybe that's what the Big Bang was. <laughs> Isn't your mind blown right now? Aren't you filled with a sense of awe oh, and amazement? Doesn't this idea conjure in your mind the image of an Ouroboros of creation, of universes giving birth to more universes, of life perpetuating itself and creating more life? It's beautiful and it's deep. I feel like if someone had told me something important, like if I had just been told a secret I wasn't supposed to know. And Asimov has a knack for writing endings like this. He doesn't do it all the time, but when he does it, oh, this is the most impactful ending I have ever read, along with the ending of Animal Farm. Now, that's technically not the ending of the book. It does goes on for a few more pages, where they talk about nationalism and patriotism and moving the moon, but that's not what stays with you. What stays with you is this idea of the Ouroboros of creation. Now, about the plot hole I mentioned earlier, well, maybe the aliens from Universe A weren't actually looking to make energy. Maybe they were losing energy with every kilogram of matter they transferred to Universe B. But their goal wasn't to make energy. Their goal was to change the value of the strong force in their solar system. This would change the conditions in their star and make it born for a few more centuries after which they could start getting hydrogen from other universes and then grow their star and I don't know, with this technology they can keep their star going indefinitely. And to summarize, this is how you do scientific world building. I only wish Asimov had spent more time developing the alien characters and showed us more of their world and their society, but that's the mark of good world building. You always want to know more. If you like this piece of world building, then come back next week because I'm gonna show you a piece of world building that I made. I call it the Crystal Universe. Thanks a lot for watching. Please subscribe and give a like. Uh, here are more videos for you to watch. And please do me a favor and if you want to share this video, share it specifically with women because for some reason, 100% of my audience is male. I'm not kidding, look at this. Uh, well, I guess it's a, there's a 2% female audience when you look at my whole channel history. And I know that if you are enjoying this video right now, there are definitely women out there that would enjoy it as well. So please help me get my content to them because the algorithm isn't finding these people. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much.